Is that really the best I could come up with? Like, come on, guys. I'm I'm really running out of ideas here. Uh, it's going to start getting bad soon. Either way, welcome to recitation. Uh, this is post-exam two. You should all have gotten your grades back and seen that. But you know what? Today is a good day. And you want to know why? That's right. Today is James Chadwick's birthday, discoverer of the neutron. Happy birthday, James Chadwick. Um... A little bit about the music at the start. I like to always say something about that if I remember to. Uh, we've gotten now music from all three Xenoblade games. Fantastic franchise, though I've never actually beaten Chronicles X. Maybe I'll get back to that at some point. Uh, but the composer for Xenoblade Chronicles X, Hiroyuki Sawano, actually has done some, some incredible stuff. I've listened to a lot of his other music. Uh, so if you liked that uh, Sylvalum Night theme, you can check it out. Also, some of you are probably wondering, Jacob, did you only record like 20, 30 seconds of that clip to use for the intro recitation? Or did you record the entire 1 minute 30 second song just to only use the first 20 seconds and then cut it off? And if you don't know the answer to that one already after being here for a couple of weeks, I'm afraid I can't really help you. Um, but yeah, at the end of this recitation, I'll play the full thing and I'll probably upload it to Canvas too. With that said, I've stalled for long enough. Uh, I'm sorry if I sound a little bit different. I had to replace a piece from my headset that was having some issues last week. Uh, tried to tune it so it sounds roughly the same, but this is how it ended up. Regardless, let's go ahead and go over and start the recitation. Uh, all right. So, normal stuff for recitation, you've got a homework that's due relatively, not like this coming Friday, but it's due next Friday, that's homework 8, you're sorting homework. After this recitation, you should have done everything, you should have seen everything you need in order to complete that, so I would recommend starting on that a little early, because it is a little bit long. Uh, homework 9 is going to release after that, that's on pattern matching, which we'll probably talk about next week. It'll get released the same day homework 8 is due, and it will be due one week afterwards. Recitation worksheet should be on Canvas by now, hopefully. Uh, today we're going to talk about the remainder of the sorts that we're going to be talking about this semester that we didn't get to last week. So that's Cocktail Shaker sort, uh, Selection sort, Merge sort, the Significant Digit Radix sort, and Quick sort. So uh, one thing that you may see come up occasionally is Heap sort. Uh, we talked about that a bit last semester, and I linked a animation to it in today's announcement. Uh, so if you are curious about that, you can check it out, but we're not going to test it or talk about it much this semester. Speaking of today's announcement, there was a link to a little form in that. Uh, encourage you to fill it out. Just give me some feedback about how stuff is going on related to recitations, not related to recitations, whatever. You can also ask me a question if you want. I've been uh, editing the responses to those in that second announcement I sent out today. All right, with that said, let's go ahead and get started. Uh, I'm not... I'll be reminding you of some stuff about sorting as it comes up again that we talked about last week, but otherwise uh, I encourage you to check out the stuff we talked about towards the end of last week's recitation for like the intro to how sorting stuff works. But the first thing we're going to talk about today is cocktail shaker sort. It's kind of like the evolution of bubble sort. You'll remember that bubble sort is really good when we have large values towards the beginning of our array that we need to bubble up to the end, but bubble sort performs very poorly when we have small values at the end of the array that we need to bubble down to the beginning. Uh, obviously you could run bubble sort backwards in that case, but then you get the opposite problem. So someone just said, why not do both? And then we got cocktail shaker sort. The basic idea is we're going to alternate between bubbling our large elements to the end and our small elements to the beginning. And when I say alternate, I mean that one iteration of cocktail shaker sort is just going to be one iteration where we do bubble sort normally, and one iteration where we do bubble sort in the opposite direction, so that bubbles down the uh, small elements down to the beginning. We do consider both of those to be kind of one iteration for cocktail shaker sort, for the purposes of like if we say like do one iteration of cocktail shaker sort on a reality check that's what we mean uh this means that each iteration basically takes twice as long as a bubble sort iteration but we only need to do half as many iterations so that balances out our kind of invariant rule is after iteration i at the very least the first i and last i elements are in their correct locations you'll remember for bubble sort we had a similar rule with just the last i elements 
So now that we're doing cocktail shaker sort, we get both of these conditions that are true. Another nice thing is if you remember that last swapped optimization we talked about with bubble sort, we get to apply that exact same optimization with cocktail shaker sort, and we can apply it in both directions. So we can we can apply the last swapped optimization going forward and the last swapped optimization going backwards. Now to do a brief example with some cards, show you what bubble sort looks like, or uh, what cocktail shaker sort looks like, and then we'll talk about efficiencies. In general on these slides, I on these pages, I have the efficiencies written at the bottom, but I'm going to talk about them after I do the actual sort example. Uh, so I know I'm kind of covering it up now. I'll give some time to talk about it later. So this is the array I'm going to be sorting. Let me make sure I've got everything right. So how it works is we start, oh, I can also uh, something I forgot to do last time is I can use some jokers to represent the current bounds of my array. So I'll kind of separate those to the side, but you'll see I'll use these to kind of mark a couple points that are important. So I compare my first two elements, 4 and 7. I don't need to swap them. Then I compare 7 and 3. Those are out of order. I do need to swap them. I can keep track. Of, this is where my last swap happened on the 7. 7 and 2 need to swap, so this moves forward now. 7 and 9 don't need to swap, 9 and 5 need to swap, Nine and six need to swap, this moves forward, then 9 and 8 need to swap. Now our last swapped thing was to this 9, so that means that the 9 is the only thing that we get to ignore in future iterations. So now that was the first half of our first iteration. So now we're going to do our reverse iteration where we bubble backwards. So we start by comparing 8 and 6. Those are in order. 6 and 5 are in order. 5 and 7 are out of order, so we swap. We can put our last swap. You'll notice when I did the swaps to the right, uh, the last swap thing went on the right element, but now that I'm doing the swaps to the left, I put the last swap thing on the left element. It's kind of which side you're going towards. 5 and 2 are going to swap. This moves down again. Uh, no, 5 and 2 should not swap. What am I doing? 5 and 2 do not swap. 3 and 2 swap. And this moves down. And then finally 2 and 4 swap. And since the last swap thing was the very end of the array, kind of the only thing we get to separate out is this 2. So we've completed one iteration, and after one iteration we have our first one element and our last one element that are both in their correct positions. So now let's start our second iteration. So 3 and 4 are going to swap. 4 and 5 don't swap, 5 and 7 don't swap, 6 and 7 do swap, and 7 and 8 don't swap. And now since our last swap happened to the 7, we can take not only the 8, but the 7 as well, and we're guaranteed that these three elements are in their sorted positions. Now we do the second half of our second iteration. 6 and 5 don't swap, 5 and 4 don't swap, 4 and 3 don't swap, so since we completed an iteration without making any swaps, we're guaranteed that our entire array has to be sorted. And we finish after two iterations of cocktail shaker sort. So now that we've got that, let's talk about efficiencies. So unfortunately, despite the fact that it seems like this should be a better version of bubble sort, uh, in terms of big O, so asymptotically, it doesn't actually perform better than bubble sort in the long run, on average. But we obviously have some cases where cocktail shaker sort will vastly outperform bubble sort. If you can imagine an array that looks like this, bubble sort would take a really long time, all like the full worst case O of n squared time, to take this element back all the way down to the beginning. But cocktail shaker sort's going to do one pass forward one pass backward, bubble this down, and then everything will be sorted. So cocktail shaker sort can sort arrays like that very fast. So it 
usually performs a little bit better, but not on average. That means we're going to get the same efficiencies of best case O of n, average and worst case O of n squared. It's an in-place algorithm. That means we didn't create any other data structures to help us do the sort. We just did everything within the array itself. It is stable. Uh, any algorithm that's just directly comparing elements that are next to each other is pretty much always going to be stable because we just don't swap if we encounter duplicates. And it is adaptable because if our array starts out almost sorted or completely sorted, we can take advantage of that pre-sortedness. I'll give a little bit longer for you guys to write stuff down, and then I will go ahead and move on to selection sort. Oh. Uh, all right, someone asked what does place mean? This means whether the algorithm is in place or out of place. So an in place algorithm doesn't need to use extra memory in terms of like extra data structures or something. Uh, out of place sorts do. We haven't talked about any out of place sorts yet, but we will talk about a few of them today. Selection sort is up next. Uh, this is also known as probably the least useful sort we teach in this class, but it's really simple and it's really easy to uh, comprehend, so we like to talk about it. How it works is every iteration we're going to essentially select select uh, the smallest or largest element and place it in its correct position after each iteration. On your homework, which I actually, now that I think about it, I don't think selection sort is on your homework, so this doesn't really apply. But if it was on your homework, you could pick whether to use the smallest or largest element, uh, as long as you're using the same, I mean, even if you don't, I don't think it actually matters. But uh, it's the same, it'll end up being the exact same number of comparisons. That's just how selection sort works, so you can pick whichever one you want to use. It's not even like predecessor successor, which, where we tell you which one to use. Uh, usually we just let you pick. On an exam we might tell you because we might want you to only do a couple iterations. How the algorithm works, one iteration of selection sort works like this. You locate the smallest or the largest element that has not yet been selected, so we ignore all of the elements we've already selected and only look at the rest of the array. Then we're going to swap that element to its correct position, which will be adjacent to the other selected elements. You can think what that means, if we locate the smallest element, it should go at the beginning of that array, versus if we locate the largest element, that should go at the end of that array. Then the next time we do it, we'd be finding the second smallest, which goes in the second position, or the second largest, which goes second from the end, so on and so forth. Then we're just going to repeat these steps until our array is sorted. Our kind of invariant rule is after iteration i, either our first i or our last i elements are in the correct locations. I want to distinguish in cocktail shaker sort it was both, in selection sort it is either. It is the first i if you pick the smallest element, and it is the last i element if you pick the largest element. Now let's do an example, and you'll notice here I have indicated that I'm going to be using a duplicate. I have the four of clubs and the four of diamonds. Uh, that's because, just as a bit of a spoiler, this is going to be our first example of an unstable sort. So I want you to see that. Remember, we're starting with the clubs before the diamonds. If the sort was stable, then we would be guaranteed that that would remain that way. If it is unstable, it's possible that they cross each other at some point. So, how it works, uh, I'm going to be doing... Let me make sure. I'm going to be doing a minimum selection sort essentially, so I'm going to be looking for the smallest element. Again, both work the exact same way, but that's just the way I'm doing it for this example. So how we'd start is we assume our very first element is the smallest, and then we loop over the rest of the elements, and if we find anything smaller, we change what we mean. So 5 is not smaller than 4, 7 is not smaller than 4, 6 isn't smaller than 4, 3 is smaller than 4. Now we're comparing to this, so 4 is not smaller than 3, 2 is smaller than 3, and 8 is not smaller than 2. So we found our smallest element, and we want to swap that to the beginning. Note what just happened. Our two duplicate elements changed order. 
for unstable for a sort to be stable, it has to maintain the relative order of duplicate elements throughout the entire sort. We can't have times where completely duplicate elements ever cross each other like this. So automatically we know that our sort is unstable, even if they somehow switched back before the end of the sort, which I don't believe they do. Uh, if I do it right, they don't. So, next iteration. So now we can ignore this 2 because we know it's in its correct position already. So we start by assuming 5 is the smallest, 7 is not smaller, 6 isn't smaller, 3 is, 4 is not smaller than 3, 8 is not smaller than 3, so this is our smallest element. We can swap it with 5, and then now we know that these two are correctly in the right place. Next up, assume 7, 6 is smaller than 7, 5 is smaller than 6, 4 is smaller than 5. Uh, here 4 is not smaller than 4, so we keep it on this 4 of diamonds, and then 8 is not smaller than 4. So we swap these two. And now, it obviously, in this example, it might look like, oh, if I had decided to take the second four because there are duplicates, if I had switched it, would that have made it suddenly stable? No, because you can just come up with counterexamples where that obviously doesn't work. If we started with that array, that would break it. We go again. Six. Five is smaller than six. Four is smaller than five. And eight is not smaller than four. So this is our smallest element. We swap it to the beginning, and that's done. Now 5 is our smallest element, 7 is not smaller, 6 isn't smaller, 8 is not smaller. So what this essentially does is it swaps with itself. Uh, you can hard code it to not swap if it's the first element, or you can just make it swap with itself. It's the same thing. Keep going. 6 is smaller than 7, 8 is not smaller than 6, so the 6 and 7 swap. And it's now good. 7's the smallest. 8's not smaller than 7, so 7 swaps with itself and goes here. And once we're down to one element, obviously, there's nothing for it to swap with. So we have now done selection sort and sorted our entire array. And if that whole time you were thinking, wow, this process seems super convoluted and long, uh, you are exactly correct. Selection sort is a very slow sort compared to everything that we've talked about so far. One thing about selection sort that is useful, though, is compared to all the other sorts, it makes relatively few swaps. So every element only needs to get swapped once to its correct position. Uh, obviously, other swapping happens with the elements that it swaps with, but we only ever need to do n-1 swaps, essentially, versus something like uh, cocktail shaker sort in its worst case might do n-squared swaps or something like that. O of n-squared. So if writing to memory, so actually doing the swaps, is a really expensive operation, it might be useful to use something like selection sort. Uh, but in general, selection sort is very slow. Because the algorithm doesn't depend at all about like whether things are actually sorted or not, in every single case, best, worst, and average, it is going to perform O of n squared. The first iteration does n minus 1 comparisons, then n minus 2 comparisons, n minus 3, so on and so forth, and if you sum that all up, you get O of n squared. However, one nice thing is it is an in-place algorithm. Uh, we don't ever do make any other data structures for this. All we need to do is keep track of an index, and that is constant memory space. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, it is not a stable algorithm. We can have duplicates that swap relative places, uh, and it is clearly not an adaptable sort. If our array starts out already sorted or nearly sorted, selection sort still does the exact same amount of work. I'll give a couple more uh, seconds for people to write stuff down or compartmentalize everything. Uh, TAs have been doing a great job, as always, of helping me answer questions. But something I realized when I was thinking about previously is I know I always uh, constantly thank the TAs for all their help, but there's one TA in particular that I have don't believe I've given a shout out to yet, and that is Ivan, one of the TAs. If you're ever wondering uh, who made that cool like starting soon screen, who makes all these cool thumbnails that go up on Canvas, that is Ivan's handiwork. Uh, it is awesome, and this would not be as high production value without him. Uh, also, if you ever end up finding yourself looking at like old recitations for some reason, and you see like overlays and stuff we've got going on, I don't believe we've used them at all this semester. Uh, those are his work also. 
Uh, the one thing that's not is that animation, like with the CS uh, CS1332 TA production, that one's mine. Uh, I made that a couple summers ago. But uh, yeah, I realize I don't think I've shouted him out yet. All right, with that, let's go ahead and move on. This is kind of the end of like the basic iteration, iterative sorts. So we call these like the simple sorts or the iterative sorts. Uh, from here on, we'll be moving on to more complicated things. Assuming I can separate pieces of paper. All right, merge sort. Uh, generally, out of these last sorts, if you've learned how to do one of them or seen one at some point, merge sorts, decent decent chance that that's the one you've heard about. Uh, merge sort is our first example of a recursive sort that's going to use a technique that I, I was going to say we like to call, but just is called divide and conquer. So a lot of these last sorts fall into that divide and conquer category. The basic idea behind merge sort actually has very little to do with sorting. Uh, turns out merge sort is going to do almost no actual sorting. All merge sort's going to do is it's going to say, I have some fancy algorithm that lets me take two completely sorted arrays and merge them together into one longer array that is still also sorted. And that's the only real algorithm that we need to use for this. Merge sort isn't going to sort really sort anything, but we're still going to end up with a sorted array, which is really cool, honestly. How it works is by dividing up the array, we can eventually re reach a base case of size 1. And remember that a size 1 array is always sorted, because there's nowhere else for the element to be. And then once we reach sorted arrays, without doing any sorting, we can just use merge to put everything back together and make everything remain sorted. So how this works, uh, one kind of iteration, I say that with air quotes because it's recursive, so iteration doesn't really have as much meaning is we're going to split the array up into two subarrays of equal size if it's even length. Uh, if it's odd length, we're going to put the extra piece of data on the right. Uh, that matters for your homework implementation, so please be careful with that. Then we're going to recursively call merge sort on both subarrays. Now since merge sort should in theory leave our array sorted at the end, now we have two sorted subarrays and we can merge those subarrays back together into the original array, and therefore our original array is sorted also. Something I want to mention is in your homework, this split array and copy into two subarrays step, that is kind of just a loop through your original array, copying all the elements one by one into the two subarrays. There isn't really a faster way to do it. You do need to create those two new subarrays for this problem, and you do need to copy those elements in manually. There isn't like a really fast way to do it or a nice cheat way or like a way to do it with the original array. You have to make these new arrays. How this merge algorithm works, this is the thing I've been leading up to. This is like the big thing for merge sort is we take both of our subarrays and we compare the smallest unmerged elements in both of them. So that's essentially, it starts as the two elements on the far left, then as we might merge some, it like can move up a bit for what we're comparing, so on and so forth. We're going to take the smallest of the two out of those two items. If they're equal, we'll take the one from the left subarray, that's gonna maintain our stability. Uh, and we'll put it into the next available index in our original array. We're going to repeat this process until one of our subarrays becomes emptied, then we're going to merge all of the remaining elements from the other subarray. Uh, there's nothing to compare them to at that point. Now something I want to mention for all of these sorts, it's going to be kind of difficult to understand them just from reading what I have written on the page. So I'll be doing examples for all of them obviously, and you can use the visualization tool to run examples yourself. Doing those examples probably with this kind of in your mind or next to you is probably what's going to help you actually understand how these algorithms function. I'm giving you a little more time to write this before I start the sort. I've been stalling for a bit because uh, this sort is kind of going to uh, take up a lot of this page because I'm going to be moving down as I do it. But with that said, let's go ahead and start our example. I'll start at the top of the page. Here is the array we're going to be sorting. Our first step 
is to look at this array and say, merge sort says, I have no idea how to sort this thing. What is a sort? So it's going to say, maybe if I split this array up into two pieces and try to sort each of them individually, maybe that's something I can manage. So now it's going to look at this size three array. It says size three, way too big. I have no idea how to sort something that's size three. Maybe if I split it up in half, maybe that's something I know how to sort. Looks at this, says size one subarray. I know how to sort that. Bam, I'm done, already sorted. Cool, I'm good at this whole sorting thing. Now it moves over to this subarray. It says, oh, size two, way too big for me. No idea how to sort that. Maybe if I split it up, I can sort it a little bit better. Size one subarray, bam, sorted. Size one subarray, bam, sorted. So now we've finished the split on these and we've reached the point where we have two sorted subarrays we want to merge back together. So we start with a pointer to the smallest element in both of them. And we compare them. We say that four is less than eight. So four gets merged first back into our original array. Then since there's nothing left in our right subarray, we take the element from our left subarray and put it in right after it. All right, we've completed a merge, so now we go up a step. Now we've sorted this right subarray and we've sorted this left subarray, so we're prepared to merge them back up into our original size three subarray. So we start with a pointer on the smallest element in both of them. Four is less than six, so we merge in four first and then move this pointer over by one. Now six is less than eight, so we merge this uh, six in. Now we've emptied our left subarray so we can merge the eight in. So now we have successfully sorted this left subarray completely. Now we look at the right subarray. Merge sort says size four, way too big for me. Split. Size two, we go to the left first. Size two, way too big for me. Split. Size one, already sorted. Size one, already sorted. So we set up our pointers. 5 is less than 7, so we merge 5 back in first. Then there's nothing left in the right subarray, so we merge in 7. We look at the right subarray. Size 2, way too big. Split. Size 1, sorted. Size 1, sorted. Now we do our merge. 2 is less than 3, so we merge in 2. Nothing left in our right subarray, so we take the rest of the left. Now we've got these two sorted size two subarrays, so let's go ahead and merge them. Start with our pointer on the smallest thing in both. Two is less than five, so we merge in two. I'm gonna move this down a bit. We move this over. Three is less than five, so we merge in this. Now we've emptied our right subarray, so we can just copy in everything else from our left subarray in the same order it's already in. Now, obviously, in with the cards, I just kind of picked up both of them and dragged them. Uh, in your code, you still need to loop over these elements to copy them in, but obviously you don't need to compare them against anything. Now, we've got a size 3 and size 4 sorted subarray. Sorted subarrays, plural. Uh, and we're going to merge them back into our original array. So we set up our pointers. 2 is less than 4. So that goes first. This moves forward. 3 is less than 4. Now four is less than five, so we take this one. Five is less than six, so we take this one. Six is less than seven, so we take this one. Seven is less than eight, so we take this, and then there's nothing left in our right subarray, so we take this. And now, without doing any actual sorting, only by doing the merge algorithm, we've sorted this array. So that is super cool, that we sorted entirely with merge. And that's how we end up with our sorted array. I encourage you to run a couple more examples of this using the visualization tool, uh, see how things run, work out some of those larger merges yourself to see how things run. But it is a super cool algorithm. Now, talking a little bit about the efficiency, uh, how it works, it's a little bit difficult to explain the exact like derivation of where these come from. The basic the basic idea is if you think about every time I like did a split and moved the cards down, and this is visualized super well in the visualization tool, by the way, is every time I did a split, that's essentially cutting each of those subarrays in half. So I can only do that a maximum of log n times. So there's kind of log n levels to those splits. 
and the total amount of work I need to do in each of them for all of the merging operation ends up being total O of n work on each of those levels. So overall, if you multiply those out, you get n log n work. And you'll notice this had nothing to do with the fact that whether stuff was sorted already or like super out of order. Merge sort works the same way either way. We have that little optimization with uh, taking the rest of the subarrays once we've emptied one of them, but that just means we do less comparisons. We're not actually doing significantly less work. So best average worst case O of n log n on all of those. Now place this is our first out of place sorting algorithm. I'm sorry, I'm terrible at drawing straight lines, so let's kind of cut it. This is out. And that is because each of those times we needed to make those new subarrays in order to actually uh, sort them and then merge them back in. If you try to do an in place merge sort, I think it ends up being O of n squared log n, which is much worse. So you definitely will be doing the out of place variant on your homework, making those new arrays every time and passing them into your merge sort method. Now, it is a stable algorithm. Uh, the reason we get that stability is every time we're comparing two elements, if they're equal, we take the one from the left. And that is because that if we have two equal items to two duplicates, we want the one that was originally on the left to go in first. And following that logic is going to maintain the stability of merge sort. And it seems relatively clear that this is not an adaptable sort. If our array was already sorted, while we would do a couple things a little quicker, it doesn't significantly change our big O. And if our array is like almost sorted, it doesn't get really much better either. It's just kind of always going to be this O of n log n. I guess I can move this off of that. Uh, so we have an n log n sort that is out of place, stable, but not adaptable. And this n log n is kind of like the gold standard for sorts that do comparisons like this. Uh, you can actually prove that getting a worst case better than n log n using a comparison based sort like this isn't possible. Uh, that's the best we can do. We can get a best case better than that. Obviously bubble sort has a best case of O of n, but we can't get a worst case better than n log n for comparison based sorts. I'll give a couple more seconds on this, and then we'll move on to another really weird sort called LSD radix sort. I see someone asked about the space complexity of merge sort. Uh, we don't really talk about it that specifically, but you can see that it's going to be O of n space complexity. The reason for that is you'll notice that I kind of handle the entire left subarray before I do anything on the right. And if I do it like that, all of those left subarrays get garbage collected by the time I move on to the right stuff. So at the beginning, we created a total of O of n space, then O of n over 2, then O of n over 4, n over 8, etc. And if you sum all of that up, you get a total of O of n space complexity. All right, should be enough time. Let's go ahead and move on to radix sort. So this is the one sort that I can't really do that well using cards, uh, unless I want to confuse all of you by sorting in ternary. So I'll be doing an example of this one on the next page with some other numbers. Um, but either way, let's talk about LSD radix sort. This is an iterative sort uh, but it doesn't really kind of fit in with the other ones like bubble sort and selection sort, so we put it in its own category. It is a non-comparative sorting algorithm. So the reason I stressed up things about comparative sorts when I talked about the worst case of merge sort uh, is because LSD radix sort is able to do better because it's a non-comparative sorting algorithm. Now a consequence of this is every other sorting algorithm we talk about in this class you can give it some comparator to work between two arbitrary elements, and it can sort anything that you can possibly compare. Radix sort, this is not the case. There is a limited number of things that radix sort is able to sort. It cannot sort everything. 
Generally, it is used just to sort numbers, but you can also use it to sort things like strings. But there isn't an infinite, or there isn't, there is a limit to the, what things you can sort with radix sort versus everything else can sort any comparable things or any things that you can give a comparator for. How it works with numbers, which is what we're going to be talking about in this class, is it's going to sort them by place value. So it's going to sort with least significant digit radix sort. It's going to sort them by the ones place, then by tens place, then by hundreds, then thousands, so on and so forth. Now, I'm going to give this algorithm, and I'm essentially, in this example, I'm going to talk about it, how it works only with positive numbers, because writing it with negative numbers, potentially also, uh, takes up twice as much space on the page. Uh, so it's a little bit difficult to write examples for this. On your homework, you have to be able to handle both positive and negative numbers. So how it works is we first create 10 buckets, one for each digit, 0 through 9. Uh, what that is, is it's essentially an array of linked lists. The important thing is that each bucket is a linked list or some Q thing. You'll see why later, but if you look down here, you see the word FIFO. That means that what each bucket is made up of should probably be some FIFO data structure like a linked list, which can work as a Q. Obviously, if you were handling negative numbers here, you would need more buckets. You'd actually need 19 of them, negative 9 through negative 1, and then 0 through 9. But for positive numbers, you only need 10 buckets. Then our first step of radix sort that you can do is we can determine what the total number of iterations we're going to do is. Now, what that is, is it's going to be the length of the number with the largest magnitude, which is essentially going to be the number of digits that our longest number has. And that's because if all of our numbers have four or less digits, then we only need to sort four times by ones place, tens place, hundreds place, and thousandths place. So we need that length of the largest number, largest magnitude number, the number of digits we total have. Now when I say magnitude, obviously I mean absolute value. Uh, when you're dealing with negative numbers, you should be careful with integer.min value. Remember that math.abs of integer.min value is an integer.min value. So you can get this weird thing if you're like, if math.abs num is greater than current max, uh, that doesn't work with integer.min value. You have to write it as an edge case. There's really not a good way to handle this homework that doesn't edge case integer.min value at some point. Then this is the actual main meat of the algorithm. This is all stuff that happens beforehand. And again, uh, we'll run through an example of this that will help you kind of understand things a little bit better. Uh, I'll even like prob I might pull the page back up too afterwards. Now for k iterations, so we're going to do a total of k iterations where k is this thing. k is the length of our number with the greatest magnitude. We're going to do all of this. This is kind of a snapshot of iteration i. So on iteration i, we go through each number in our array. We take the num digit in the ith place. So the zeroth place is the ones digit. The oneth place is the tens digit, so on and so forth and we're going to append the number to that digit's bucket. So if the digit in the zero in the ones place is a one, we append it to the ones bucket. Uh, if it's an eight, we append it to the eights bucket, so on and so forth. For positive numbers, if we're only dealing with positive numbers, we have 10 buckets, we calculate the digit as num divided by 10 raised to the ith power, and then mod by 10. If you think about it logically, this essentially cuts off everything to the right of the uh, ith digit, and this cuts off everything to the left of the ith digit. There's a couple other ways to do this too, but this is the most common. Now, if your array is handling both positive and negative numbers, you should instead do the calculation like this, where you first do num divided by 10 to the i, mod by 10, and then add 9 onto the end. Uh, something I realized I, right after I wrote this, on your homework, you should be using this one. You should not use this one at all. A lot of people, I, I realized when I wrote this, people might interpret it as if the number is positive, you do this calculation. If the number is negative, you do this calculation. No, if your array has negative numbers in it, you do this calculation for every number, both the positives and the negatives. That's an important distinction, and I see people mess that up all the time. Now, I noticed someone asked how you calculate k efficiently. 
Uh, once we've determined the number with the greatest magnitude, what we can do is we can count the number of times we have to divide by 10 to get that number down to zero. So like with integer division, obviously. So with something like seven, seven divided by 10 once gives you zero. So it's got one digit. With like 84, we divide by 10 once and get eight. We divide by 10 a second time and get zero. We had to divide by 10 twice, so it has two digits. Uh, on this homework, we do not allow converting numbers to strings, and we don't allow using math.log, so you have to do those calculations yourself. We also don't allow you to use math.pow, so you'll wonder, how do I calculate this 10 to the i? Uh, do I write my own power method? No, do not write your own power method on this homework. How we are going to calculate 10 to the i is you'll note the fact that on the very first iteration, i need 10 to the 0. On the second iteration, I need 10 to the 1. On the third iteration, I need 10 to the 2. So what you can do is you can use a trick we call a running divisor. You'll use this in homework 9 also. How it works is we have some number that we initialize to 1. We have all the logic that goes in our, uh, like all the number logic that goes in here. And at the very end, we do something like divisor equals divisor times 10. Now on the next iteration of the loop, we have the next power of 10, and we don't need to recalculate it every time because calculating exponentials of numbers uh, is not as quick as like multiplication or addition or something. So you want to use this running divisor trick, not some power method. So this concludes our step of putting all of the numbers in the buckets. Now we have to empty the buckets. So we just iterate over all the buckets in the same order they are in our array. We empty each one of them in FIFO order back into the original array. And then we repeat this process for the next digit, and we keep going until we've done k iterations, and then somehow our array is magically sorted after that. I'll give you guys a cup a little bit longer just to finish writing this down so you can use it as reference when we do our actual example sort, because uh, that is going to be on a different page. Hopefully that was enough time for everyone. Uh, otherwise you can pause right now, but I will move on to our example. Can't really use cards for this because I need a lot of numbers that have multiple digits. So this is gonna be the array we're working with. 155, 248, 280, 223, 52, 3, 130. I have written out here what my buckets are gonna be for the first iteration, uh, but first we should calculate how many total iterations we do. So looking at the array, obviously we should be doing three iterations because our largest numbers, all, all of our numbers have three or less digits. But how we can do it uh, in terms of code is we look at all these numbers, we say 280 is the one with the largest magnitude. Then we're gonna count how many times we have to divide that by 10 to get to zero. So we divide that by 10 once, we get 28. We divide it by 10 again, we get two, remember integer division chops off those decimals. We divide that by 10 again, we get zero. So we had to do three divisions by 10. So we know that K is going to be equal to three. So we'll be doing a total of three iterations of radix sort. So let's start. We're going to first fill our buckets. So we look at all of our numbers and we're going to be looking at the ones place of each of them. 155 has a five in the ones place, so it goes in the five bucket. 248 goes in the eight bucket. 280 goes in the zero bucket. 223 goes in the three bucket. 52 in the two bucket. 
3 also in the 3 bucket. Note it's going after 223. And then 130 in the 0 bucket after 280. So that was the process of filling the buckets. Overall, relatively simple, especially in a diagramming perspective. Uh, even in code, it's not that bad once you're using that formula to calculate your digits. So now we empty the buckets. So we go through an order, starting with the zeroth bucket, and we're going to empty them. Now these go back into like our original array, the same thing that we pulled elements out of to put in these buckets. Uh, I'm not going to like overwrite everything, so I'm going to just write everything below it. But these are going back into the original array. And since we're emptying the buckets, we can just reuse them every time. Uh, we don't need to keep making new ones. So, zero bucket, remember we want to empty it in FIFO order. So that's 280 first, then 130. There's nothing in our zero bucket. Two bucket has 52. Three bucket has 223, followed by three. Then 5 has 155, nothing in 6, nothing in 7, 8 has 248, and there's nothing in 9. So that is the empty bucket step. Uh, sorry, I wasn't very specific about like writing order of operations down on the previous page with the digit calculation. Uh, that formula worked with the natural order of operations. You do the exponential first, then the division, then the modulus, then the addition. Uh, but you can write it out a little more specifically. The example that's probably about to get published in the Q&A I think had the right order, otherwise the TA will correct it in the answer. So something you'll notice now is if you look, our array is now sorted by ones place. All the things with a 0 in the 1's place, then a 2, then 3, 5, then 8. So that's cool. Now, let's look at our second iteration. Let's make our buckets. And again, it's the same buckets as before, I just need to rewrite them on paper. We're going to look at the 10's place. For a number like 3, Remember, it's essentially the same as 0, 3, so it's got a 0 in the tens place. Let's start putting things in. 280 goes in the 8 bucket, 130 in the 3 bucket, 52 in the 5 bucket, 223 in the 2 bucket, 3 goes in the 0 bucket, 155 in the 5 bucket, and then 248 in the 4 bucket. And just like before, we're going to uh, go ahead and empty all of these elements into our original array. So 3, then 223, 130, 248, 52, 155, 280. And you'll notice now that our array is sorted by, what? by tens place. We've got a 0, 2, 3, 4, 5, and 8. And you notice the two things that have the same number in the tens place are within themselves sorted by ones place. So it's got a 2 in the ones place followed by a 5 in the ones place. And if you remember, that sounds a lot like what I was talking about when I mentioned stable sorting. That stable sorting allows you to sort by multiple things in sequence, and then duplicates maintain their previous sorting. And that is because LSD radix sort, as you might expect, is a stable sorting algorithm. And the reason it is stable, uh, it is what allows, or because it is stable, that is what allows the sort to even function in the first place, is because these things that have the same tens place are now sorted by ones place. And after we sort by the hundreds place, things that have the same hundreds place will then be sorted by tens place, so on and so forth. So that was our second iteration. Let's go ahead and make our new buckets. We're doing hundreds place. Again, 3 has a hundreds place of 0, as does 52. So 3 goes in our 0 bucket, 223 in our 2 bucket, 130 in the 1, 248 here, 52 in the 0 bucket, 155 in the 1 and 280 in the 2. Now we empty these, get 3, 52, 130, 155, 223, 248, 
280, which as you'll note is completely sorted, which is crazy. And the first time I saw a Radix sort, I was just blown away because this whole time you're leading up to it, it looks like these numbers aren't even like sorted at all. You wonder like, what is this actually doing? And then magically this last iteration, bam, everything perfectly sorted. And that is just awesome because this runs really quickly, gets everything sorted, uses these properties of stability really well. I didn't really even understand why stability was that important until I learned Radix sort. Uh, but this is why it works, because these things have the same zero digit, or the same hundreds digit, so they're sorted by tens digit. Same with these, these two, same with these two, so on and so forth. That's why that stability is so important, so that these elements actually stay sorted when we do these higher di digit sorts. I'll give a couple more seconds, uh, and then I will go back and we'll talk about our efficiencies. All right, let's talk about efficiencies. So remember that k is the largest number of digits for any value in the array. That's the number of total iterations we're doing. And if you remember, all we did is every iteration, we just filled up all our buckets, we looped over our elements once to fill up all our buckets, then we looped over the buckets to empty them out. So that's just O of n work total. And since none of this depends at all on like what the array looked like at the start, we're only ever doing O of k times n work every time. Now someone asked the question earlier in the chat, uh, why do we have to write the k n? Isn't k just a constant we can drop? And no, in this case k is not a constant. It is still a feature of our input. Obviously sorting 12 million uh, two-digit numbers is not the same as sorting 12 million numbers that each have 24 digits or something. Uh, those are very different amounts of times. One's going to run 12 times faster than the other. So that k is very important in talking about how fast our sort runs. It's a feature of our input. But in general, k tends to be very small, and in general much smaller than n, or specifically much smaller than log n, which means that when you can use radix sort, it tends to be one of the fastest sorts you have option you have at your disposal. Because if you're sorting like 100,000 three-digit numbers, Radix sort is going to do that in three iterations, which is super cool. Now, obviously, this is an out-of-place algorithm. Uh, we needed to create all those buckets to use, and those buckets are linked lists that you're going to have to store potentially our whole array in it. So we do have to use non-constant amounts of space. It is a stable algorithm, as I mentioned earlier, and also you can probably see it's not adaptable. Uh, we're not getting any improvements if our array is already sorted, because everything just goes in the buckets, we run the same number of iterations. Some common mistakes we see with radix sort is if some people try to terminate early if they put every number into the zero bucket, uh, that is not a termination condition. You should not have any kind of edge case that checks if every number is going in the zero bucket. That is not correct. Don't have this. Uh, remember that since we're having negative numbers in our array, make sure you're creating 19 buckets and you're having that plus 9 in your digit calculation. That's important. And again, that plus 9 should be there even for positive numbers, because we want like positive 9 to go in bucket 18 and negative 9 to go in bucket 0, essentially. because index zero of our buckets corresponds to the negative ninth digit, so on and so forth. Uh, any negative number is always going to go into our negative buckets. Essentially those buckets go like negative nine, negative eight, negative seven, zero, one, two, eight, nine. So those are the buckets versus their indices are zero, one, two, 9, 10, 11, 17, 18. i pretty sure. Yeah, I didn't screw that up. So that's important. 
when you're trying to find k, remember that when you're finding like the largest possible number, uh, the largest absolute value number, be careful of integer dot min value. It can have some edge cases. I think there were some questions about that in the Q and A. You can look at. Uh, and remember, writing a or using a power method is pretty much always going to be inefficient. Do not write one. You do not need one for this homework. You should not use one for this homework. Another helpful tip is you should probably do reality check 30 before you start radix sort. Uh, it involves writing a little bit of code for radix sort, and remember that you do get the answers to reality checks after you attempt them. So attempt reality check 30, check your work against the answer, and it will probably help you when writing your homework. It does use a different method of terminating radix sort that does work correctly. I encourage you to look through that and think about why it works and why it's important and why it is different from this condition at the top. So look through that on your own. And next we'll be talking about our last sort of the day, which is quick sort, uh, and then that will be the, it for this recitation. All right, let's take a look at quicksort. Quicksort is a weird sort. Uh, it took me quite a while for me to get this on my first time, or like the first time I learned it. Obviously it's a bit more intuitive for me now, but I'll hopefully try to make that a little bit better for you. Uh, I know the bottom of the page is getting a little bit weird. I'll move it up when I get down there, but that's a while in the future. So quicksort is another recursive divide and conquer sort that is comparison based. Now remember, merge sort was based entirely on the merge algorithm and how we can use that to sort an array. Quick sort is going to be based on an algorithm called partition. Now as a bit of a look ahead, partition is a magical algorithm that takes some element and splits our array up into everything less than that element and everything greater than that element. So using partition on a particular element is going to always tell us exactly what index that element is supposed to be at if our array was completely sorted. And it magically puts everything to the left of it and everything to the right of it. And you can probably imagine ways that we could use this magical algorithm to sort an array. Obviously, if we just call partition on every single element, uh, it would end up in its correct spot. But we can do a little bit better than that using some cool uh, dividing up and working on subarrays work. We can get a little bit better. How it works is we start quick sort. We randomly select an index that we want to use for the pivot. Uh, I'll note, I'll try to distinguish when I'm talking about the pivot index versus the pivot element. So we randomly pick an index, which gives us a pivot. Uh, then we're going to use the partition element, the partition algorithm based on whatever value that pivot was. And remember, that's going to guarantee that the pivot ends up at its correct position somewhere in the array, and it divides the array up into things less than it and things greater than it. Then we're going to recursively call quicksort on the things less than it and on the things greater than it. Now, something I want to distinguish is in merge sort, we created entirely new arrays to use to recall merge sort on. For quicksort, we don't need to make those entirely new arrays. We can do everything in place. We just need to make a helper method that takes in what the bounds of our subarray is, and then we can do all of this quicksort work without creating new arrays. And that's going to be cool. You can even see some look ahead. That's going to make this an in-place algorithm. Uh, sometimes this is called in-place quicksort. Now, how do we actually do this partition algorithm? And again, this might make more sense after you see the example, but I'll still explain it first. What we do is we swap the pivot to the front of the subarray we're currently working in. Then we scan, starting from the immediate right of the pivot, scanning towards the right, we're going to try to find an element that is larger than the pivot. We call this pointer i. We're going to have a second pointer that scans starting from the end of the subarray and keeps going to the left until we find something smaller than the pivot. Sometimes we call this pointer j. Now, if once i and j find their respective element, if they have not crossed each other, we're going to swap the elements that are at array i and array j. 
Then we move i forward by 1, we move j backward by 1, forward being to the right, backward being to the left, and we repeat. Uh, otherwise, so this is if i and j have crossed. Now something I want to mention is if i and j cross during this scanning, we're also going to stop. So you're going to need that have i and j crossed. You need that condition like three times in your code, pretty much. Once here, once here, and once here. As soon as i and j cross each other, cross is going to mean going past each other, not overlapping. We're going to swap the pivot with array at j, specifically j, not i, and stop. So that's the algorithm. What does it look like with cards? I'll give a little bit of time first for people to finish writing this down because it is a lot of stuff. Then we'll do the example with cards. Uh, again, there is a lot of resources on, or there's the visualization tool, which you can use to see what these things look like. A lot of these sorting algorithms have pseudocode in the Sai Krishna slides that you can look at or in the uh, lecture video slides. So I encourage you to look there if you need some help. Be careful with quicksort. If you're looking on the internet, the internet has some other implementations of quicksort. If you use those other implementations of quicksort, you will receive a zero for quicksort. So make sure that you're basing it off of what we teach in class, recitation, on the Sai Krishna slides. Those are all fine things. Just make sure your algorithm should be resembling what we talk about here and what we show. All right, let's go ahead and run through an example. This is going to be our starting array. Now, just for the sake of this, I'm gonna say that I'm gonna pick five to be my pivot element. Uh, you could imagine that I it was somewhere else. I picked it and swapped it to the beginning first. Uh, but here, just to make it a little simpler, you don't generally want to always choose your first element as the pivot. Ideal pivots are going to be somewhere around the median of the array. Uh, we have no idea what index that is, so we can't just pick the middle. Um, so we just pick a random element. So if we always pick the first element, an issue can be that the worst case of quicksort is always picking the smallest or largest elements. And if we always pick the first element and someone gives us a sorted array, then we would have the worst case of quicksort for a sorted array, which is kind of bad. So we just pick randomly, and that's going to make it a little bit better. But I'll talk a little more about that later. So now we set up our i and j pointers. i starts at the element immediately to the left, to the right of the pivot. j starts at the end of the array. Now we move i first. 3 is less than 5, which is correct. Remember, we're on the left, so we want things smaller than the pivot. We move forward. 8 is greater than 5, so i is going to stop. j is over here. 7 is greater than 5. We're on the right side of the array, so we're fine with elements greater than the pivot. So we move down. Now 4 is less than the pivot, so we stop. i and j have both stopped. We have not crossed each other, so we can go ahead and swap those respective elements. So we swap 4 to here, 8 to here. Then we can move i forward by 1 and move j backward by 1. Now, we start again. 6 is greater than the pivot, so i is going to stop immediately. 9 is greater than the pivot, which just means j moves. 2 is less than the pivot, so we stop. i and j have stopped. They have not crossed each other, uh, even though the cards are touching. The actual pointers have not crossed. So we're going to swap 6 and 2. Now i gets incremented, j gets decremented. And now i and j have crossed each other. i is now greater, strictly greater than j. So we stop, we don't move them anymore, and we swap the pivot with the element at j. It's going to swap the 5 and the 2. And now our pivot is guaranteed to be in the correct place. You'll see everything less than the pivot 
is to the left of it, and everything greater than the pivot is to the right of it. It's not guaranteed that either of them are sorted. In this case, it just so happens that our left subarray was sorted, uh, but you see that our right subarray is not. And now we can recursively call quicksort on either side of it in order to uh, continue to sort our array. So I'll do that a little bit quicker, uh, just so you can see an example. So we start on this. Let's say I choose four to be my pivot. So four is my pivot, I swap it to the beginning. I set up my i and j. Uh, I'm going to be honest, I think this is what the ones I was using. So i is less than the pivot, so it moves forward. They overlap, but that's not... Cr oh, this is off screen. Uh, they overlap, but that's not crossing, so I keep comparing. i is less than my pivot, so it moves forward. And now i and j have crossed. This is an indication that I should stop checking for comparisons. You'll notice this is actually kind of out of bounds of my subarray. So I should not compare here. Since they've crossed, I swap the pivot with index j. And now this 4 is in its correct position. And I would call quicksort on this subarray. Uh, some people like to edge case the size 2 subarrays just by comparing the two elements. 2 and 3 don't need to be swapped, so they're in their correct positions. You can also run the quicksort algorithm on that size 2 subarray, and it will work fine. In that case, you're base casing with a size 1 subarray, which is fine. So now we can do it on this size 4 thing. Uh, let's pick 8 to be my pivot. So I swap 8 to the beginning. I set up my i and j. 9 is greater than 8, so i stops. 7 is smaller than 8, so j stops. We swap the elements at i and j move them forward by one. So now i and j are equal. i is less than, the element at i is less than the pivot, so we move i forward by one. And they've crossed, so we stop doing comparisons, and we swap the pivot with element j, with the element at index j. Now 8 is the pivot was in its correct position. There's a size 1 subarray here, so we know it's in its correct position. We've got two elements here, we can compare them, they don't need to be swapped, so they're in their correct positions. And we're now done with quicksort, and our array is magically sorted. Now let's talk a little bit about efficiencies. So one thing with uh, quicksort is I can talk about the worst case efficiency. Now in the worst case efficiency, you'll see it'll be cases like I did with that left subarray, where if I choose the smallest or the largest element as my pivot, then I'm going to just iterate one of the pointers all the way through the array, swap it to one of the ends, and then I get a size n minus 1 subarray and a size 0 subarray. So it doesn't split my array up in the slightest. And that's going to be the worst case, is if that happens every single iteration, it ends up being the exact same as selection sort which is that really bad O of n squared sort. But it turns out this is the worst case. Practically, it almost never happens, but it is still something to consider from a big O perspective. Average in best case, I can tell you that they're going to be n log n. The reason as to why is actually uh, a topic that you'll cover in a different class. Uh, usually one of the early assignments in CS3510 or CS3511 is to try to derive exactly why this efficiency happens, so we're not going to spoil the fun for you. You'll get to it later. It is a little bit complicated and outside the scope of this class, though. As I mentioned earlier, this is an in-place algorithm. Even though we're kind of drawing them as separate subarrays sometime, all of the work is happening within the original array. We're not actually creating any new arrays for this. Uh, everything happens within that one starting array, so it is in-place. However, it is not a stable algorithm. You can see we did some uh, large swaps that went like across the entire array. That is an indication that you're dealing with an unstable algorithm. Uh, with a stable algorithm, you're generally only swapping elements that like are being compared right next to each other. Uh, it is not an adaptable algorithm either. Obviously, we never used the fact that we dealt with it, that we might have started with a sorted array for this. I even mentioned that if you pick the first element as the pivot every time and uh, do quick sort on a sorted array, you actually get the worst case for a sorted array, which is one of the reasons why we randomly select our pivot index. 
Uh, so yeah, quick sort, not adaptable at all. Even though our best case is better than the worst case, it's not adaptable. Remember the little heuristic trick that helps in this class at the very least is to look at the best in average cases. All right, that is all the main content I had. I'll give a couple more minutes for people to write this down. Then I will play the rest of that intro video for you guys so you can see the rest of it. I'll also probably upload that one to Canvas uh, in case people are curious or want to watch it on their own or extract random clips of me doing things as GIFs that look amusing. Uh, there's some moments in that that would probably make good emotes for our uh, 1332 Slack. If someone wants to do that, that'd be cool. Uh, don't go too overboard though. But either way, that's the end of the actual content from this recitation. I don't really have a lot of time to do like a big card trick, plus there are a lot of cards already this recitation. And the next trick I have I've only practiced once and it was last week, so I'm not super confident it would go well. The 1332 slack is for the TAs, not students. I should be more I should have been more specific about that. All right, I think that was hopefully enough time to get stuff written down. Uh, you can obviously pause on this since there's nothing really afterwards if you want to have a little more time. But otherwise, we will leave. Oh, someone asked, what do I like better, Slack or Discord? Uh, different things for different purposes. Slack works better for what we use it for as a TA group. Discord works better for groups like the Georgia Tech Discord or something. Uh, so I'll leave you guys off with uh, how I spent my... Essentially, how I spent Monday night, because uh, that was a couple hours making this thing. Enjoy. <laughs>